today, Vladimir Duthiers, who is a correspondent with CBS award-winning, Emmy award-winning, Peabody award-winning, uh, URI alum, is going to be giving the commencement speech this Sunday at URI, at commencement, and getting an honorary doctorate. Vlad, welcome to the studio. Thank you for having me. Well, appreciate you taking the time to be able to Skype in here. Honorary doctorate. Did you ever think back in 1991 you'd be going back to URI and accepting your honorary doctorate in 2017? Uh, no. I, um, you know, I, I don't know if the university remembers that uh, I barely graduated, but um, I uh, was, and I'm joking about that. I mean, I, I was a, 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 a Solid gentleman, see. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, I, I never, I never thought that I would, um, that the university would uh, uh, honor me in this way, and it's, it's really sort of a humbling experience. I was very humbled to, to receive the call, uh, and that they wanted to do that, and, and even more humbled um, and honored when they asked me to deliver the commencement address to uh, the graduating class of 2017. Because um, I remember very clearly, actually, um, my commencement speaker was Kurt Vonnegut. And uh, yeah, I remember being wowed by his speech. I was um, inspired by it. And so hopefully I'll be able to do the same. I'm not as talented a writer as Kurt Vonnegut um, or as accomplished as he is. But uh, hopefully I'll be able to um, encourage the, the graduating class to, uh, to live out their dreams. And um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to it on Sunday. So I guess that was going to be one of my big questions. Is it, is it really following your dreams? I mean, I, I do want to ask you about how you came to where you're at in the world of journalism, but is that really the sort of centerpiece of what you're going to tell the students to follow their passion? Um, you know, I, I, there, I, I always feel that when there are commencement addresses, uh, that there tends to be a, um, a series of sort of, not cliches, but they're sort of maxims that you hear over and over again, uh, you know, follow your dream, live <laughs> out your passions. I, I have sort of a different message. In fact, as I was preparing for this, I, I, I thought about asking people what advice they remember from their teenage years or their college years that they thought was absolutely useless. Usually, you ask people, <laughs> you know, what would you, what would you, you know, say to your 21-year-old self, or what would you uh, say that you know uh, inspired you when you were a child? I, I sort of took the opposite approach, and I, I was curious if people thought um, what people thought about the advice that they received when they were growing up. They thought, oh, this is not at all worth it. Uh, <laughs> <and>, um, <laughs> because I think that you, you'll sometimes look back and go, yeah, the, the, the advice that person gave me was nothing. <laughs> was um, so my, 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 my theme has always been, I think, um, and it was sort of introduced to me when I was at URI, um, which was a, a quote that uh, has is generally attributed to St. Augustine, which is... Um, the key to immortality is living a life worth remembering. And I think all of us, uh, we all want to do something that is going to have meaning, and we all want to do something that hopefully will be remembered for. Um, life doesn't always work out that way. And so when I first when I first heard that maxim and I first started to think about it and apply it to my life, I thought that it meant that I should do something that was really, really important. and. In my mind, growing up, really important meant, you know, something that would have people talking about me in, a, in a positive way, where people would say, oh, you know, there goes the GTA and, you know, and the work is done. But as I've gotten older, and especially as, as I, um, what, after I entered into the field of journalism, I started to realize that the key to mortality is living a life worth remembering, but it's, I was looking at it from a very, you know, almost selfish in fact, the key is just that. It's becoming the key for others to live their life. And it's becoming the key that allows you to immortalize others and to make others known and to make their voices heard and to make their stories heard, um, especially in, in places in the world uh, where that is not always, always possible. So for me, um, ultimately, it turned out that I had many keys in my life. I had people who supported me and who, um, who, for whatever reasons, felt that um, I was worth taking the time out to um, to help develop. And that ranged from people like Anderson Cooper, CNN, and at CBN, and, and Christiana, so you are 
graduate. Um, I was her intern when I first became a, a journalist. Um, to others who, you know, even as recently as three years ago when I was uh, leaving CNN, CBS, there was an executive um, at CBS who uh, is now the executive producer for the uh, Late Show with Stephen Colbert. He was at the time the executive the uh, CBS This Morning, which is the morning show on, on CBS. And I was interviewing at CBS for a job, and he sort of he sort of encouraged me to step out of my comfort zone, which was that of somebody who, you know, I tend to be, my parents are immigrants with this like attitude that whenever you're talking to your elders, you should be deferential and, <laughs> and very sincere. And you know, in, in the business of journalism, especially television journalism, you know, people are very aggressive. And when they go in and they meet people, they are usually very, um, you know, they, they press upon people how amazing they are and amazing what they do. That's really not my style, but he encouraged me to, to try to be that way. And so, um, so there have been a lot of keys in my life, and I think that that's ultimately the message that I'm going to try to deliver to the, to the students, which is try to be the key to somebody else's being more talented. And you talk about, as you said, being the key to someone else's immortality. You know, all the work that you've done in the journalism sphere, and and the and the especially the stories being told that you've you know gotten the awards for. Um, you know, Boko Haram, the, the girls there, um, you know, is, is that sort of, I mean, to encapsulate what you just told us, Vlad, again, is, is that how you see your role in journalism, as you said, being able to, to be able to, to have that voice and, and to provide the importance to somebody else to get their story out? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I'm glad you brought those girls up. Um, in April of 2014, uh, 276 girls uh, who were studying, who were students um, in a part of Nigeria uh, where girls are not very educated, the northeastern part, the Muslim uh, area of Nigeria. It's very difficult for girls to go to school there. The, the, that part of the country is one of the more economically depressed regions of the country. Um, but these parents had decided uh, that they wanted their children to have an education, much like the children that uh, and the students that we'll be talking to, that I'll be talking to tomorrow, just like us. We, yeah. Our parents wanted us to have an education, and um, that should be every child's right. And these kids were, these young girls were studying at a school um, at a dormitory, and in the middle of the night, the terrorist group Boko Haram, which is affiliated with ISIS, uh, came to uh, their school and capped them. All 276 girls were just taken. And it's really hard for people sometimes in the West to understand what that's like, because you think to yourself, their institutions and the police and the military, you know. But in Nigeria, there's no there's no Amber Alert that goes out when somebody goes missing, right? I mean, uh, and certainly you would think that 276 girls would be a a huge. You know, think about this case in, in Nigeria. Boko Haram has killed in just the last uh, three years or so more than 10,000 civilians, mostly um, men, women, and children. They they burn churches, they burn mosques, they they slash people's throats, they hack people to death. Uh, it, they are a terrorist group unlike any other. Even in some instances, um, it, it, it's hard to equate with what's going on in the Middle East, but this is a very, very brutal, brutal group. Anyway, these girls are taken, and for the first couple of days, we don't hear anything, We, meaning the journalists. We don't hear anything from the Nigerian government. I'm sorry, one second, there's a package coming. <laughs> Vlad did promise me that he's like, I'm expecting something here at my apartment now. He's coming up to URI tomorrow for the commencement speech on Sunday. But I told him I hope it was like a little kid kind of coming around the corner with something to say or, or do something funny. But uh, I, he's just taking some time out of his schedule. So he said he had to pop over to the door. So if you're just joining us now and haven't been with the be uh, since the beginning, this is Vladimir Duthiers, who is getting his honorary doctorate from URI this weekend, giving the commencement speech to the undergrads on Sunday. And um, yeah, getting his honorary doctorate, explaining about his role in journalism. Again, Emmy Award winning, Peabody Award winning, uh, talking actually just now about the role working with Anderson Cooper has had in his life. So in talking a little bit about what that's going to mean to uh, be able to give the graduation speech, he said back when he was graduating in 91, I think he said they had Kurt Vonnegut, and he said very inspirational. So what he said was just, you know, telling folks to maybe not take all the advice they usually hear at graduation ceremonies, but sort of to find their own way. So um, hopefully he's finding who it is who's coming by to uh, deliver something to him there. As you know, we usually every Friday have Russ Moore here in the studio. He will be joining us after we wrap up with Vladimir Duthiers. 
And um, of course we have Frank Carini with EcoRI talking about the latest in environmental news. Speaking of environment, super hot today, broke the record. It's on Go Local, you can see that data, but um, the record has stood since 1906. So here we are, 2017 and uh, breaking the record. So if you're uh, out and about, hope you're staying hydrated, staying cool. I think it's supposed to be actually a lot cooler this weekend. So uh, plan accordingly, lots going on. Of course, you can see 10 great things to do in Rhode Island this weekend on Go Local if you haven't already made your plans yet. But as I'm looking, it's getting a little busy down here. Uh, there is a water fire this evening. Um, so if you're coming through Providence or planning to go anyplace else in the state, be aware if water fire is not your final destination, that there'll be probably a little influx of people taking part uh, in water fire here this evening. And of course, this evening means Pat Ford's The Coalition Show at 6 o'clock from 6 to 9. Uh, Pat, again, took his show over here to the Go Local Studios. Uh, I believe he's got a great lineup of guests this evening. I know he's got Senate candidate Representative Bobby Nardalillo. Um, he's also got the big libertarian... Uh, uh, annual dinner on Saturday. He's got one of those guests who's going to be here as well. So you can check out his lineup. And it looks like Vlad's back as I was. Did you get your package, Vlad? I did. Sorry about that. <laughs> I actually meant to be delivered yesterday, and, and for whatever reason, they just moved it now. Um, no, no worries. I was filling folks in. We're actually having a water fire here in Providence this evening. And in the studio here, I can see sort of more people on the streets. So I figured I'd do a little public service announcement and tell folks to just remember that in their travels if they're coming into Prov because it gets very crowded. Um, so maybe just to go back a little bit, yeah. the, kind of one of, the, one of the questions I have for you, Vlad, because you know, looking at your bio and your career, since graduating in 91 with a degree in political science, how'd you get into journalism? So I, I, um, my parents were, uh, my mother's from Haiti, my father's from France. Uh, they, they, um, most immigrant parents believe that to be successful in the United States, you must only follow three career paths. <laughs> yes. You should either be a doctor or a lawyer uh, or possibly an engineer. Um, <laughs> everything else is just a hobby. So yeah. when I told my mom um, and, and my stepfather that I wanted to be a writer, a reporter, a journalist, uh, my mother said, well, writing, that's just a hobby. That's not a career. You're not going to make money from that. And uh, for the first couple of months after graduation, I did struggle to get a job. Um, I really was sort of not very clear at how to find a job in journalism, the kind of journalism I wanted to do. So my roommates, who were all URI grads, were now living here in New York City, and they were all working on Wall Street. They wanted to be, you know, masters of the universe. <laughs> the wolves of Wall Street, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what they, they really wanted to be that. And, um, you know, I remember saying to my buddy, he said, you should come and get a job with us at this at this Wall Street firm. And I said, I don't know any, I didn't take any business classes at URI. And he said, uh, that's okay, you don't need to know anything about business to work on Wall Street. Uh, and I always show that that's how we got into so many difficulties in October of 1929. But, but I started working on Wall Street and I thought to myself, I'll do this just for a few years, and I'll make a little money, and then I'll be able to uh, focus on my writing. And then 20 years later, I had just, you know, risen to the uh, highest levels of the firm that I worked at. Um, it was the second largest investment firm in the world. And very quickly, I would say within within two or, two or three years after I started working on the street, um, the, the company moved me to uh, abroad, to Luxembourg. Um, and I was only 24 years old. And I was living in Europe and I um, was traveling to Europe and the Middle East and ultimately to Asia and Latin America. And you know, I got promoted. I was an, AB, an assistant vice president, then a vice president, and ultimately a managing director. So life was really good, and I had no complaints, except that as I got closer to my 40s, I started to think that this was not a life worth remembering. I, I was doing well for my bank account, I guess, and, um, <laughs> but it just wasn't fulfilling, and it wasn't um, something that, had, uh, th that I was passionate about. And I was with a guy in Stockholm on a business trip, and he he, I, I just read something about like the Sri Lankan civil war, and I started to talk to him about it, and he was completely bored. His eyes were glazed over, and I just thought, you know, he's a good guy, but um, it's tough to be around people who don't share the same passion and the same zeal for the, what, the things that you do. Mm. And I, and people are usually surprised, and they say that it's that I'm sort of exaggerating, but I'm not. I, I went back to my hotel room, and I, and I started thinking about how I would do, how I, I would make a change in my life, and. Uh, and I thought, well, what did I want to be when I was a kid? And not like 
you know, when you think about being an astronaut, like how, <laughs> you know, like what yes. did you want to do when you were like 11 or 12? And, and I always wanted to be a reporter. And so I started to um, make some inquiries when I came back to New York about maybe starting in an entry level position at um, some, you know, like NBC News and, and Fox and some other places. And uh, a lot of the um, well-meaning HR people uh, <laughs> thought I was going through a standard midlife crisis. They, they really didn't understand how somebody who had, you know, dozens of people reporting to him and who had raised, helped raise $3 billion in Japan on, on my last deal would want to start as a, as a $26,000 a year production assistant. Um, you know, getting coffee and making copies of, you know, scripts for, for anchors. And um, it took a lot, I just wasn't able to convince them. They just didn't think that I was legit. And so I ended up having to um, in not only leave my job, but then I applied to graduate school because I figured if I could, if I was a grad student, then I could get an internship. And if I could get an internship, I'd have my foot in the door and then I'd have to make, create those opportunities once I was able to do that. And that's what I did. I, got, I started, uh, I applied to graduate school here in New York and um, uh, for journalism, to get a master's in journalism. And uh, very quickly, the um, human resource, uh, the, the career <laughs> service person at, um, New York, at Columbia University called Christian Amanpour and said, I got this guy who's traveled to 50 countries who's, you know, 38 years old and he'd be really interesting for you um, to have on your show as an intern. And I got hired like that very day. And that was sort of my first moment in the business. Well, fantastic. I mean, does this something to speak to too when you're talking to college grads that, you know, where you're at at 22 might not be where you think you're going to be at 32 and might not be where you're at at 42. I mean, talk about someone who's had, you know, you've kind of had two careers. I mean, is that yeah. something to, uh, you know, instill in kids graduating school that you, the path that you set out on might not be the one that is, is actually destined for you? I mean, I, I think that um, we living in 2017 do not have to live the lives that our parents and our grandparents lived, which is that, you know, you started with a job and then you did that job until you retired. I think that um, no matter how old you are, no matter how entrenched you are in a particular field or a career, if you want to do something else, the opportunities are there. The question, of course, will always be how much are you willing to sacrifice to achieve those dreams? For me, um, I did start. People uh, like the joke that I retired from Wall Street. I, I, wasn't, <laughs> I was just a guy who was, you know, middle management guy. Um, I had a mortgage and I had, um, you know, uh, bills and, and I had to live. And, you know, to be 38 years old and starting again at the, at the entry level, which is what it was, um, and making, you know, $30,000 a year, which I, actually I think is less than I made when I first started working right out, out of URI. Um, and certainly the standard of living has gone up since then. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you will do different things if you are willing to um, step out of your comfort zone. And that may mean moving to a smaller apartment. That may mean getting rid of the big house and the big car and the pool and, you know, and all those trappings of success. Um, if you realize, I, in my mind, this is just the way I've sort of um, dictated my life, which is that if you realize that all those things are just material possessions that really don't matter, um, what matters is what you do for others, in my mind, um, then you'll always be wealthy, you'll always be rich, you'll always feel good about what you do, you'll always feel um, as if you're contributing uh, meaningfully to, to the world. Um, and it's not... It's not easy, for sure. If it was easy, I think everybody would do it. <laughs> no, certainly not. But, you you know, just the career that you've had, um, obviously, you know, when you made the switch to journalism, but Emmy Awards, Peabody Awards, and now coming back to URI to, to talk to undergrads, it's just a success story that we were so glad that we were able to get you to Skype in and talk a little bit about. We look forward to uh, getting the reaction to your speech, and I wish you a great trip back up to URI and down to Kingston and your old stomping grounds and seeing all the kids. Um, just wish you a great weekend, Vlad. I appreciate your Skyping in. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it and hope to meet you in person soon. Yes, would love that, Vlad. So I'll let you go and I'll welcome my next guest. So safe travels up to Rhode Island. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.